So lesson 12 is on allotropes. We're going to start with what's allotropes, uh, then we're going to talk about examples, and finally we're going to discuss network solids. Allotropy is a property of some chemical elements to exist in two or more different forms in the same physical state known as allotropes of these elements. So if you look at the picture, we have graphite and diamond. They're both created of just carbon atoms. However, they look completely different. They have completely different physical properties, but they're both in the same physical state as solids. The three main forms are allotropes of pure carbon, or what we call diamonds, which we see in the bottom right-hand corner. That's what a uncut diamond looks like. Graphite, which is in the top right-hand corner. And another thing that's called Bunkminster fullerene, which is a crazy molecule which we'll talk about in organic chemistry. The physical structure of the strong covalent bonds determines the physical properties of the allotrope itself. So thinking about diamonds and graphite, Diamonds clearly, because they're the strongest of the minerals, diamonds clearly have a very strong physical chemical bond. But when we talk about graphite, something that we use in pencil lead, that when you rub it against something as soft as paper, it immediately breaks apart and lays itself out. So that means it has to have very weak covalent bonds. Every allotrope of carbon has a unique structural shape. So if you look at graphite, it's in thin layers on top of each other, which is why it, it breaks off very easily on paper. Diamonds have a very complex structure, which is why they're such a strong, hard mineral. And if you compare the two samples, light, for example, will not pass through graphite because the sheets themselves will block out all the photons. But because of the unique structure of a diamond, it allows for light to actually get stuck inside the crystals also exciting those electrons to make the diamond have a brilliant shine or a rainbow effect. The strength and structure of the physical sample is in a direct relationship with the bond itself, so do not forget this. The oxygen that we breathe is called O2. That is, it is comprised of two atoms of oxygen. Ozone, which is O3, occurs in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, one atom of oxygen is just atomic oxygen. Atomic oxygen doesn't exist naturally for very long on the surface of Earth as it is very reactive. Um, you can see that even though they're comprised of the same atoms, ozone and oxygen, that we breathe, uh, they have a different structural formula. And because they have a different structural formula, different shapes, they also react differently when we're doing chemistry. For example, ozone is very bad for us to breathe in. It will damage our lungs because the second ozone goes into our lungs, it's going to split up into oxygen, O2, and then that free atomic oxygen will immediately want to bind up to something oxidizing lung tissue, which is very bad for you. Right. Covalent bonds also have this unique ability to form something called a network solid. And a network solid is what we call a macro molecule. Macro means large. So therefore, these covalent molecules are going to be very large. What happens is that the atoms share their electrons, but the atoms are arranged in a regular crystalline pattern, very much like an ionic crystal, in which each atom is shared with a neighbor atom indefinitely. The more atoms that are being shared, the bigger the crystal is going to be. So if you think about water, which is H2O, or methane, which is CH4, these are going to be very small or micromolecules. When we think about macromolecules, they're going to be very large things that you can physically hold in your hand. You'll see three examples coming up very soon. All of the macromolecules, all of these network solids, are going to be incredibly hard. They're very hard, they're very dense because they have a very high melting and boiling point. But if you were to crack or hit these things hard enough, they would shatter like glass because they're very brittle. And because of the fact they're very brittle and they have a high boiling and melting point and they're very hard, they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. So you would not want to use these network solids to conduct electrical lines or to be used in any type of cooking or crafting of heat stuff. 
Some of the examples are diamonds, what we see in the top left-hand corner. Diamonds, as we know, after they're cut, give off a brilliance, which means a rainbow effect of light. And if you notice, their melting point, diamonds melt at around 6,422 degrees Fahrenheit, which is incredibly hot. It is the hottest of the three examples that I give. The second hottest is going to be called carborundum, which is a silicon carbon molecule. You'll notice that unlike diamonds, these are going to be dark crystals. And these crystals give off their own unique rainbow effect, but you don't need light to pass through them. These guys are going to be melting around 4,946 degrees Fahrenheit, also incredibly hot. And finally, the more common one that we've all seen is quartz, which is silicon dioxide. Quartz is commonly found in a lot of commercial goods. For example, if you have a watch, the face of the watch or that glass is actually made of quartz. That quartz is incredibly hard, which is nice because otherwise your watch face might get scratched, but it also melts at around 3,038 degrees Fahrenheit. So all three of these examples are incredibly hard. If you hit them hard enough, they will shatter, which means they're brittle. They melt at incredibly high temperatures, and they do not allow heat or electricity to flow through them.